What's so amazing is this step-by-step chronology in Matthew 24 of the signs leading up to the rapture and the wrath of God and how they are the exact same signs we see in Revelation chapter 6 through 8, which are speaking of the seven seals that need to be opened before the scroll, the wrath of God, can be read. If you have never seen this correlation before, it's something else. So let's take a look at the first match starting in Matthew 24, verse 5. The first thing that Jesus says in response to this question is, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Now if we turn over to Revelation chapter 6, as the first seal is broken, it says, And I saw, when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now it's the majority evangelical view here that this writer is the Antichrist and not Christ mostly because of the company that he's keeping, and also the fact that the Lamb was the one that opened the scroll. And I agree with that interpretation. I also think that there's a tie-in to the first birth pang that Jesus mentions in Matthew 24, because unlike later on, he says that this individual will claim to be the Christ. And that may explain why he's riding a white horse, just as we see Jesus doing many chapters later in Revelation 19. So it may be that he's wanting people to believe that he is the return of Christ. Also because of the bow that is mentioned and the conquering. If you were to read a description of the Antichrist by Daniel the prophet in the Old Testament, you would find that the Antichrist is obsessed with conquering. Christ is nowhere described as having a bow as well, but instead a sword. Also, in Revelation 13 verse 1, the Antichrist's heads have ten crowns, a symbol of authority, and his authority was given to him by Satan in verse 2, which is also a match as we see here with Revelation chapter 6. And for all those reasons, I believe that the first seal corresponds to the first events in Matthew 24. Okay, so we're going to call that one a match and move on to the next one. But the real test will be to see if they continue to match all the way up to the sun, moon, and star sign and after that. So let's move on to Matthew 24 verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Okay, so let's check this out with the second seal in Revelation 6 to see if we have a match. And it says, When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one, and its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. Now that one seems pretty straightforward. Sounds like wars to me, so I think we can call that one a match and move on to the next one. Let's take a look at Matthew 24, verse 7. So we see back here in Matthew that after Jesus says, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, he then says, and there will be famines. So let's check the next seal in Revelation chapter 6 for famines. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. So, an entire day's worth of work for one loaf of bread, I don't think that anyone would argue here that the third seal is speaking of famine. So famines are a match, and let's move on to the next one, Matthew 24, verse 9. And there we see that Christ describes that people will be hated and killed for his name. All right, so in Revelation 6, it says, When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Okay, a lot to talk about here. First, there is a general connection to our Matthew 24 verse, being put to death is the primary point here, but the seal talks of much more than that. And I think the key to showing the connection here is this last phrase, by the wild beasts of the earth. While it's true that God used a sword, famine, and pestilence to discipline Israel in the past, and even wild beasts in Ezekiel 14 verse 21, there's no prophecy of a future judgment of this nature against Israel. One interesting point is that the word for by, as in by the wild beasts, is a different Greek word than the other withs in the verse. The New King James, which I'm using, does reflect this difference, but you can see this clearly if you have a regular King James version. 
The other widths are Strong's number G1722 called N, and this one is G5259 called hypo. When it says with sword and with famine, that's the Greek word in, but with or by wild beasts is a totally different word in the Greek, and it means something different too. Vincent Word Studies says the preposition by is used here instead of in or with, indicating more definitely the actual agent of destruction. The meaning is defined as under, often meaning under authority, of something working directly as a subordinate. So the first interesting thing is that it seems that the other things in this verse, the killing with sword and famine, are by or under authority of the wild beasts, as the New King James has it translated here. Another interesting thing is that the term wild beast, as some translations have it, has led to some false interpretations. It should be first admitted that wild beast is not the correct translation of the Greek in Revelation 6, 8. The word is thyron, and it basically means beast. And it can be translated as beast, Titus 1.12, or wild beast, as in Acts 11.6. Context determines which translation is best. It's used 39 times in the book of Revelation, and 38 times the term refers to either the beast, as in the Antichrist, or the false prophet, the second beast, or the image of the beast, and it correctly is translated there as beast. However, the translators, attempting to clarify the meaning in Revelation 6, verse 8, incorrectly translated the text as wild beast, the only time it is not translated simply as beast in Revelation. There is no grounds for the translation wild beast in Revelation 6.8, since the beast, Antichrist, in Revelation 13.7, and the false prophet beast of Revelation 13.15, and the image of the beast in Revelation 13.15 all have the power to put to death, just as it says here. Both the beast, Revelation 13.1, and the false prophet, Revelation 13.11, are better reference for the beasts of Revelation 6, verse 8. Both famine and plague, then, are here attributed to the methods in which these beasts kill. That is, in addition to the swords, which is obvious if this is speaking of the Antichrist and false prophet. Famine is something that could be a result of only people having the mark being able to buy or sell, and therefore this could be the cause of this famine. But I also think that both the famine and the plague are things that could be orchestrated by evil people today. The famine in Russia, for example, killed millions of people, and it was largely man-made. It was the result of price controls and requisitioning. Some people say that Lenin was trying to break the spirit of the people and steal their land with it, but that's really conjecture. At the very least, most of the evidence is that Lenin and his associates knew the probable results of their agricultural policies, but were willing to take the risks. According to one of his associates, Pipes, Lenin repeatedly said that he would sooner the whole nation die of hunger than to allow free trade in grain. Plague also could be engineered by the Antichrist and the false prophet with modern super viruses, etc. Or it could simply be the result of the famine. So we will call that one a match and we will move on to the next one. And back in Matthew 24 it says, Therefore when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads let him understand, for then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no nor ever shall be, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened. So verse 15 is the first time in Matthew 24 that we can put a time as to where we are in the scheme of things. He speaks of the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. And most everyone agrees that this is the midpoint of the last seven-year period. If you want to know more about that, almost any study of Daniel's 70 weeks will bring you up to speed. Basically, there's a final seven-year period that will begin when the Antichrist makes a peace agreement with Israel. And at the midpoint, three and a half years in, he will declare himself to be God in the temple. Now, you will find references to this time all over the Bible. Sometimes they call it the abomination of desolation, as it is here. Other times it might say 1,260 days, or 42 months, or time, time, and a half of times, or even a time unlike any other time that has ever been or ever will be. Every time you see one of those phrases or numbers, it's talking about this midpoint right here in Matthew 24. So consequently, we know more about this exact time than any other time in prophetic history, and it will really help us as we progress. Almost every time it's spoken of, it says that this is the beginning of a great persecution of the elect. 
the entire section here is telling people to flee because of the persecution that will start at that point. So Jesus says Daniel talks about it. Let's turn over to Daniel and see what he says happens right after the abomination of desolation. Daniel 11 says, And they shall defile the sanctuary fortress, and they shall take away the daily sacrifices, and place there the abomination of desolation. Those who do wickedly against the covenant he shall corrupt with flattery, but the people who know their God shall be strong, and carry out great exploits. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by the sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. Now when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help, but many shall join with them by intrigue. And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. I find it interesting that in the exact same time frame in the book of Daniel, the time just after the abomination of desolation is set up in the temple, Daniel speaks of the same scenario, an intense persecution of the elect of God. I think it's also interesting that we see that God has a particular plan in the deaths of these martyrs, which is also exactly what we see in the next seal in Revelation 6. So let's check it out to see if it's a match. It says, When he opened up the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. So this seal is entirely about martyrs, and that's exactly what we see happening in our Matthew 24 verse. But the most interesting part of the fifth seal is that the martyrs are asking God how long it will be until he judges those that are killing them. And this would seem to indicate that all that has happened so far in the seals, wars, famines, etc., are not part of God's judgment. Also interesting, the reason God waits is because the number of their fellow servants and their brethren would be killed as they were for it to be completed. In Matthew 24, verse 22, it says, And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Those days are about to be cut short for the elect's sake. These souls are not going to have to wait very much longer for God to avenge them. In fact, it will happen in the very next seal. Okay, so death and the fifth seal martyrs are a match. And we'll move on to the sun, moon, and stars one. And I think this one's going to be pretty obvious. So let's check our Matthew 24 passage first. It says, Immediately after the tribulation, or ellipsis, of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Now, if we continue to use Matthew 24 as a guideline for the book of Revelation, we would expect to see this exact same sign there, too, the sign that the day of the Lord and the wrath of God is about to begin. And in fact, that's what we see in Revelation chapter 6 when it says, I looked, and when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? It seems pretty open and shut here, but there's so much more to this. If we look at Luke 21, which is a parallel passage to Matthew 24, we see Luke talking of this exact same thing. He says, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads, because your redemption draws near. Notice he talks about this idea of men who are terrified for what is about to happen, just like in Revelation chapter 6. This is very important, as we'll see. Also notice that, as we've already talked about, believers will take a totally different view of this event and will not hide, but look up in expectation. That is because the rapture will happen just before the day of the Lord begins. 
Some of you might be thinking that this passage is speaking of Armageddon because it's sometimes taught that way. But this is the unambiguous start of the day of the Lord with the sun, moon, and star signs, just as Joel prophesied. Armageddon happens just before the millennium. In addition, the very next seal, the seventh seal, is the introduction to the seven trumpets, which proves that they are chronologically linked to the seals, which causes a huge problem because the fifth trumpet, the one about the locusts, is five months long. So the day of the Lord must be at least five months long, and there's simply not enough time for the day of the Lord to be completed if it starts at Armageddon. It must start before then. The rapture will be an event that everyone will know about. The idea of a secret rapture is not biblical at all. This event, the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory, is an event that everyone will see. All the other lights in the sky have been darkened. People will definitely know when the rapture happens. Now, if this is the correct exegesis of this text, that the wrath of God begins at the sixth seal, it will cause many problems for the pre-tribulational idea. Because for them, the wrath of God was supposed to start before any of the six seals began. So they tend to argue with this verse. The argument is made that the tense of the verb, here translated as has come, is in the errorist tense, and therefore it could mean that the wrath had been coming before this time. This is a flimsy argument for several reasons. The errorist tense is generally speaking timeless. One common use of the aorist tense, as we have in this passage, is the so-called ingressive use of the aorist, and it is in fact used to describe the beginning of something. One biblical example of this is in Mark 14, verses 41 through 43, speaking of Jesus' betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane. It says, Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. That word there is in the ingressive use of the aorist. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude, with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. The context here is obvious. This has come is referring to the beginning of his passion, not an event in the past. Similarly, the context in the Revelation passage is obvious. The men are hiding themselves because the day of the wrath of the Lamb has come, and it's about to begin. This is consistent with many other scriptures. The sign they saw was what Joel said would happen before the day of the Lord. Also, we see in Luke that the reason why these men were hiding was that they were in expectation of what was about to come. So, if this parallel exists, we should now see the rapture at this point. So let's check our Matthew 24 verse, verses 30 and 31. And this is what happens immediately after the sun, moon, and star sign that we just saw in Matthew 24. It says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Chapter 7 immediately follows the sixth seal, and we see two events that apparently happen simultaneously. Some of your Bibles will title the seventh chapter as Interlude, because it takes place before the opening of the seventh seal in chapter 8. The first event is the sealing of the 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe. This protects them from the wrath of God that is about to follow. They will become the first fruits of unsaved Israel in Revelation 14.14. 14. These were not saved until after the rapture, which is why they were not raptured. The other simultaneous event in this chapter is that a multitude of people from every tribe, peoples, and language, which cannot be counted by man, appears in heaven. We see the same terminology in chapter 5 about people from every nation, tribe, and language are the ones who are redeemed by Christ from the beginning of time. So, let's look a little closer at this multitude that just showed up in heaven to see if it's those that have just been raptured after the sixth seal. Notice that this multitude is clothed in white robes. It appears that these people have bodies. People who are redeemed by Christ won't have bodies in heaven until after the rapture, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 15 through 52. Contrast that with the fifth seal, where they were only described as having souls. They were only given white robes and told to wait a little while longer. A great multitude from every nation suddenly showing up in heaven with bodies 
can only be the rapture. Then John told us specifically who this group is. The elder says that they are those who come out of the great tribulation. This is the tribulation specifically spoken of by Christ in Matthew 24, verse 21 through 22. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened. And later Jesus says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and glory and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This phrase out of in Revelation 7 is from the Greek preposition ek and has the connotation of out from the middle of. The pre-tribulational viewpoint here is that this multitude, which no one can number, are those people who became Christians after the rapture. Remember, if this is talking about the rapture, it would mean that the church goes through persecution before the rapture. So they argue here concerning a verb tense again. They say that the word come in this verse should instead be translated who are coming. They say that the word for come is a present participle that is often translated as coming. The idea that they're trying to convey is that this group does not arrive suddenly in heaven, but that they have been trickling in as they have been martyred. The problem for them is that the time of the Greek sentence is fixed by the verb of a sentence in its context, not by a participle. In this example, the participle phrase, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, is attached to two Greek verbs in the aorist tense, washed and made and both referring to an event that has already been completed before the eyes of the onlookers. The point is, is that these words tell us the timing of the phrase, not the participle. This is also why one of the elders refers to this multitude as having already arrived when he says, and where did they come from? If the elder was witnessing an ever-increasing number of people, this would not be the appropriate tense to use. If this parallel continues, we should expect to see the beginning of the wrath of God next in the seventh seal. The sign has been given, warning the world of God's impending wrath. The righteous are now raptured and safe in heaven, and now the day of the Lord, the wrath on the wicked, should begin. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel having a golden censer. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood. And they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. A few things to notice here. First, the idea of silence in heaven. There is usually at least praising of God by the cherubim that hold up his throne. But that seems to stop for half an hour as the soberness of what is about to happen sinks in. Almost 6,000 years of God's patience with the wicked is about to run out. So we see the contrast here. While the six seals were bad, wars and famines, persecutions, it pales in comparison to just day one of the wrath of God, in which a third of the trees are burned up and all the green grass is burned up. So I think that there's enough evidence to convict here that these two passages are parallel to one another. 